So if you are shopping to purchase, I, I recommend using ours or one that you already have for this class because we're gonna cover the basics. So to go out and purchase a RED camera would be just really crazy. You don't need all those components right now. We'll get to that um, in time. But right now, exposure triangle, composition, um, where to place your camera and why, what the settings are, that's what's really important right now going forward. So um, I don't want you guys to get buried into thousands of dollars when you're, when you're learning something that we can easily give you for 160 bucks, so much easier uh, to save you that money. The equivalent, last time I checked, and it wasn't this summer, but the previous, um, if you were to rent this camera uh, model, the equivalent or something similar, whether Nikon, Sony, whatever, for the course of the whole semester would be roughly like 700 bucks before your insurance. So um, I'm trying to keep it as affordable for you guys as I can. You can help me by not losing things like your, your charger. <laughs> Um, the little caps, we, we allocate those as like what we call a consumable because they do get lost. Um, I don't know that I've ever seen one damaged, <laughs> so they get lost. Uh, if something happens, accidents happen, cameras do hit the ground, cameras do get a little wet. The big thing you can do is prevent some of these things like don't leave Oh my God, that sounds gonna kill me. Um, don't leave the camera in your car ever, even if the weather is nice. We absolutely had a kid get his window busted in because he was clearly had a camera bag in his passenger seat. Um, and it was one of the ones like what Dayton has and he had a laptop in it too. So that cost him a lot of money real fast, um, including we had to do a police report, just a paperwork nightmare. And so, um, and I'm not gonna lie to you and pretend that I'm perfect and that I absolutely always and doing all of these things I'm going to tell you, uh, but don't follow my practice as much. Um, I totally left a lens in the car the other day for like an hour, and then I realized, oh my God, it's outside. This kind of heat, horrible, horrible, horrible for an electronic system. Anything um, for that matter should not be you know, in a car for that long. Um, <clears throat> so there is a lot of ways that you can find these now. Yeah, go ahead and, is that, um, is that up? Would, slow it down hopefully does is that mechanical room open did they leave that open i might just turn that ac unit off sorry guys we have an ac unit that is kind of screeching and and beeping a little bit they're they're looking into it we have someone coming by again um but yeah adam asked about what what some of the other places is ebay a good resource i know people who purchase stuff off ebay personally myself not as much but um I think it's a pretty safe avenue. I don't think that's a bad route. Autorama.com, great source. They hook us up with uh, really, let me write that down if you're wanting to actually. Autorama out of New York, really great company. They work well with us on a lot of stuff. Um, we have a, a higher ed rep there. So I purchased probably three fourths of the stuff in this building uh, over the last year has gone through them. Um, b &H Photo, uh, also, all, I mean, they're pretty much the exact same thing. Um, both out of New York, uh, ran really similarly. Um, you can't order anything or get anything shipped during any of the Jewish holidays. That's worth noting because during various times of the year, if you order something, it might be more like a month out. So it's nice to know that if you needed something right away. If I know I don't need it right away, I still like to go, because they do a good job with um, educational discounts and things like that. So they're super nice. You can call these people and they will help you um, quite a bit. Now, Amazon, it's uh, difficult to ignore. Amazon does have used options. You can purchase used on Amazon. Um, and, and the thing is, if you're thinking used for any of these three, it's not like they just hold an inventory of used, but I've sold equipment to them. I've traded equipment to some of these, not Amazon, but the other two. Um, so it's just kind of what first come, first serve. But you can get some pretty great deals. Uh, another one that I highly recommend is Lens Rentals for multiple reasons. Um, for the last four or five years, anytime I rent something, I look first at lens rentals. Now there's borrow lenses. If you Google it, borrow lenses is gonna be up. They're higher on the algorithm for Google right now. They uh, have never done me wrong, but I just love lens rentals. 
Um, when I had my Canada project, I rented multiple of the same stuff, and they actually called me within the hour to make sure that I meant to click that button on the inventory instead of just sending it to me. They just double checked. Just really nice stuff like that. Um, Gabe Spencer, Judah's cousin, when we produced his Africa project a couple years ago, they sent him a bad battery. <clears throat> And so when he, and it kind of put us in a bind for the time being, but fortunately I had a friend in Wichita that had some of those same batteries that we needed. When he got back, he called Lens Rentals, let him know, hey, the battery's not good. They said, send it to us. Um, when they got it in, they tested it and it didn't work. And they literally called him back and said, what do you want to make this right? <laughs> it's like a couple thousand bucks, I don't know. They were that nice. They, it's a very one-on-one -on -one scenario where you're talking to someone and not to a robot. Um, and yesterday I was trying to get my passport and that was hell. I talked to robots all day long trying to get that silly stuff figured out. Um, so I appreciate that about lens rentals. Now, even more important, um, I purchased a lens this summer. Uh, it was a thousand bucks and I didn't want to just drop a thousand dollars of my company's money without trying it. So I rented the lens first for a week and absolutely loved it. And after you rent something, you have the option to buy it from them. Um, I went ahead and sent it back and bought their oldest one. So I got a used lens for 700 bucks. That was $1,000, has worked perfectly. And the important thing about when you're getting used, you wanna check on your return options. Lens Rentals gives you 30 days when you buy an item. So I had 30 days to test it, make sure it worked. And then um, if it didn't, I had a month to send it back for a full refund. So Lens Rentals, love, love Lens Rentals. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna tote them all year long as much as I can. Um, and then you have your community boards, your community things. There's, there's companies, um, gosh, what's it called? ShareGrid. ShareGrid's like a social avenue for people to uh, rent equipment, to uh, rent out their equipment. I have friends who make money on ShareGrid renting their gear out when people come to town and they have, they have their whole list online and what it costs. Um, and obviously it's a great place to sell and share things of that nature through them as well. So there's five that gives you kind of a, a jumping off point on the things that I really have, I've had good experiences with all of them. Um, even Amazon, you know, you're, you're kind of, you're taking a little bit of a risk because we know that there's a lot coming out about bots, you know, writing in reviews for things and stuff like that. Um, I ordered something the other day and I was gonna get like a coupon if I went on and wrote a positive review for him, even though I didn't have much good to say. And so um, they're definitely peppering that part of the industry. Uh, and then, okay, another good question was about what bag do I have? What bag should you get? This is a, a very loaded question because everyone's needs are different. That's why we also have multiple options for you. Um, I recently purchased this Mosisio, Mos I don't know, I've never heard it pronounced. Um, I love this bag. I got it on Prime Day, like 50 bucks for a $100 bag. So great, great steal. Uh, it's got an outside protective case that is pretty durable as of right now. Um, I chalk it full with you know, a bunch of my passport documents. That's what you want to see. Um, not just what bag, but what goes into your bag is really important. So having a lot of pockets and a lot of padding um, with various things is super important to me because I don't know what I'm walking into. So Sunday when the guys were shooting for cinematography, I brought this bag because I knew someone was going to forget something for the tripod, something for an SD card, maybe a lens cloth. I have a little bit of all of that in here at all times that I, I don't go anywhere without. Um, as well as like a tablet and notebooks, uh, batteries, battery chargers, uh, an additional lens. So um, we'll talk more about what should go into your kit when we start processing you know, different types of projects. But if you're realizing, so if Dayton goes, this bag's too big, can I use one of the small ones? Just let Zoe or I know, they're for you. So I don't care if you're not stuck with what you got right now. Um, something that's also really important, if you start traveling a lot like we have, um, you want to find bags that have proper, you know, protection that makes it really difficult to, to rob you quickly. So in this case, this bag, my really important stuff like my wallet goes low. 
and my computer and tablet go inside here. So if you wanted to get in this bag and I didn't lock it up, you know, I'm standing, you know, waiting in security or something. Um, you're probably, if you're good at it, you're probably going to get it from me anyways, but it's going to be really difficult for you to get to the expensive, expensive stuff like, like my electronics and things, uh, my wallet. <clears throat> um, any questions about, about that stuff? Okay, let's get into why we're here, which is your DSLR or mirrorless. Um, they are, as far as you're concerned for this class, there really isn't a difference. Um, because that mirror is really more for a photography thing. And it's not that we won't do photography and encourage photography, uh, but video will be definitely movement, linking together 24 frames a second, 30 frames a second, maybe even 60, uh, is gonna be definitely more of our, our focus for this um, semester. I switched this out, so I probably don't have a battery now. <clears throat> Uh, so, well, first things first, let's just start at the very base. Oh, I noticed some of you don't have straps. If you would like a camera strap, I, um, depending on the scenario, I really like a camera strap. Depending on other scenarios, camera straps have caused me uh, a lot of difficulty depending on what kind of rigs you're putting it on. So a camera strap on our jib arm going up eight feet, super annoying, gets caught on stuff. Um, camera strap when you're on a hike, Dylan Nature Center, something like that, wonderful. So if you'd like, um, we can get you a camera strap just to keep in your bag if you don't want to use one. Does anybody, looks like most of you don't have a strap. Does anybody know they want a strap or at least would like to take one with you? Okay. Um, can you go find some of those? And we, I know some of those cameras have them on there too, and you could have this one if you wanted, if we can't find enough out there. So first things first. When I'm carrying my camera, <clears throat> this is not how I carry it. It doesn't mean it's totally wrong. Um, but I feel like my dad on vacation, you know, at like you know, Oceans of Fun or something. So I, I prefer to have it over my shoulder. This particular strap has a uh, kind of a stickier edge to kind of catch. Um, I don't like that. I like to flip that over. Now, something that's really important, especially when you have um, all of this attaching you're going through, uh, say you're running around, like when we had boot camps this summer, we were going from networking over to computer drafting to robotics to welding, so we we're just running around the whole time. We didn't load things into Pelicans and move to the next spot. So you wanna make sure if that's the case, you have the camera's lens into your body um, so that you're able to protect that lens from banging into doorways and stuff like that. Something small, something silly, but the second you feel that lens hit something, it is like a, puts like a shiver into your spine. Yeah, it's a horrible feeling. There is a sound that gear makes when it hits concrete that I'll never get out of my, my worst nightmares. So <clears throat> um, the next thing that's super important uh, is not just how you, how you move around with it, but also uh, assembling and disassembling. You won't need to change out the lens much to start, but you have a button here where my left index finger is. And at the top, about where it says autofocus, manual focus, I'll try to show you a little better there. You'll go in the top and you'll click clockwise. Now, Cali's Nikon does counterclockwise, um, which is kind of interesting because our red camera, the way the lens goes on, uh, has like it locks into it because it's holding such heavy cameras typically. So you're going to see some different things as you play with different models throughout the semester and throughout the time uh, in various classes. But in this case, these cannons click in counterclockwise. If you don't hear that click, that little, then it's not on. Um, at two lenses fell off cameras that I picked up last year. That is, uh, someone put it on, thought it was good. I came by, picked it up, and um, And one of them was a very expensive cinema lens uh, on a project. So <clears throat> uh, that cinema lens is more than this whole system by itself. So this is where you're working with these systems so you can graduate up to that, got to start practicing those silly things right now. Make sure that you're, you're making sure that your lens is clicked in um, before you utilize it. Uh, battery goes in one specific way. Um, I almost always do it backwards on the T6i. Yep, I did it right there. It's kind of like a USB port for me. I always think it's the other way. Um, this battery only goes to the T6i. 
So if you're using um, a professional 5D Mark IV, or if you're using the M50, or if you're using a G85, here's another strap if somebody wants this one. Um, this, this battery is proprietary to this. Kind of a pain. Uh, it's really nice when the batteries will go to multiple systems, but that's not the scenario with the T6i. You should have two. Good thing of practice, get one charge, get the other one on there. And if you're shooting, then have one on the charger and one in the camera. Is really just one of those habits that you start forming now that will pay dividends when you're in a more stressful scenario like a wedding. Wedding's a scenario where you do not want to be standing in the corner waiting for a battery to charge. An event taking place around you, quinceanera, uh, you know, um, a parade. You're supposed to be shooting like the Christmas parade, but you're off in a coffee shop letting batteries charge. We had something like that happen last year, a run and gun music video in Kansas City. And my brother had to keep stopping off at little shops and charging batteries throughout because it was just really poorly planned with the client. Um, so yeah, uh, and that's, that kind of leads into all these projects, all these scenarios, you're going to learn something from all of them. In fact, in a lot of cases, the worse it goes, the more you learn. Um, so being optimistic, uh, ever the optimist in media and film is super important. One, it's a lot of work. You're pouring your creativity and you're, you're trying to get your voice out and it's just not quite coming the way you want. Just power on to the next project. That's why we keep moving. That's why I give you quick deadlines. We live with what we got and we go on to the next thing. Otherwise, if you're a perfectionist, like I'm sure many of you are, uh, you might only do one or two projects the whole semester. So sometimes you just got to live with it. We'll show it. We'll get it through. We'll talk about what went well, what went bad, and we'll be on to the next project. So um, it's baseball numbers. You got to get to the plate. Got to keep going up there. <clears throat> uh, at this point, we have a hot shoe mount on the top, but we don't have flashes for them. Um, I have the, some people like to get an external flash if they're into that photography. Uh, but you're in audio or you're in photography right now. I don't think you guys use flashes for anything in that class. Maybe you will. I don't know. Did he say? No? Okay. Um, I thought most of it was what you have, you know, right here. I don't like to add in a lot of lights and flashes and things of that nature for you guys, especially until about October, because I want you to know how to adjust the camera. It becomes really easy to go, oh, I'm not sure what's wrong here. I'm going to add another light or I'm going to take a light out. You know, I'm going to close this window. I want you to be able to manipulate that and do that, but I also want you to adjust the camera to the proper settings so that you know at that point if you need to add light or take it away. Um, it's better to set up the camera, add a light, add a light source, and then another one, not set up five lights, then add the camera, and then start taking away. I know people who like that practice, but I think they just really like setting up lights, taking them down. Um, any questions up till this point? Okay, so we're recording this, so that way you guys have, and we're gonna make a more specific tutorial video as we find time. Um, and I can't give you a, a, a time frame of when that will be, but it, we'll post this lecture um, on like an unlisted link on YouTube. So if you have questions about some of this stuff, then you can reference back to it. <clears throat> the other thing here is you got to make sure, I always want you in manual mode. So go ahead and click that over to M on the top. That's the first thing. Here, let me see if I can... Zoe, you want to come help me get this in focus? I need like an extra light. There you go. So you want that M? You want it on M? We're going to live in, yeah, go ahead and just, I'll have you come help me because it's too back and forth. Um, we'll be in manual the entire semester. Now, auto modes are cool for certain things. Um, helpful with certain time. I, I shoot a lot of auto and photography on nature because I, uh, trust that particular lens I'm using to, to talk to the system quickly and identify that uh, as like a bird. It has animal settings that help me focus on that. Um, but most of the time you really need to be in some sort of a manual mode to get the best results. The last thing you want is you're trying to get a shot of the quarterback and it's trying to focus on the crowd behind them and then it because it, it does what we call searching and it looks all around. So auto modes uh, have their place, but I want you to live comfortably in manual mode. So that's not, that's one is in the overall settings. This is going to enable us to really dial into the specifics. The other one is on the camera. Now, 
I'm in manual right now. I always want the stabilizer on. If I click it, you can hear it click to on. I've heard people say that they like to keep the stabilizer off because it uses less battery. And I'm not sure Cali of Fears has that, but we'll, we can tinker with it more. Um, I, I just live in stabilized on. I just live with that. They Supposedly it uses a little more battery, but I've never seen it used to a point where I'm running out of battery. So that'll help your image be a less jittery. There's things you can do in post, but you can't always fix shake. In fact, many times you can't. So if that stabilizer's on, even if you're handheld, it should be a pretty smooth shot typically. Um, now, if I'm going, if I'm going manual on the lens, then I will be doing my adjustment with this focus ring right here, okay? This focus ring is how I will make my adjustments. Do not move that focus ring around if you're in auto. It will kind of grind the gears because you're kind of working against it. So if I do have, and, and you should dabble with this. I, uh, if you're going to do auto anything, it'd be auto focusing um, because I can still, if I, let me make sure. I'm so I got my little, oh, let me show you. <laughs> I need to get this a little more comfortable here. So I can go from the camera. It's like trying to do something in a mirror. Um, can you see that, Zoe? I can't see what I'm looking. Yeah. So you can touch it just like your phone, really. I mean, this was like remarkable technology when it came out, but now it's just kind of standard. So I can go from Dayton pretty easily to the camera right here just with a touch. So technically that's auto, but you're still controlling it. I think it's um, just a wonderful little feature that <clears throat> I really like using when I am kind of run and gun in a crowd and I don't have a lot of control. I'm like, oh, that person, I'll get to that person. Um, so we call that focus racking. We'll do a whole assignment on that eventually, uh, not right off the bat. But those are some things to play with uh, before we meet next Thursday is you can dabble with the focusing modes. Um, if I switch over to manual, then I'm racking focus manually. Right, our star there. Uh, but yeah, pretty simple, nothing too crazy right there. Um, <clears throat> things for you to try. Uh, let's see. Let's get into the settings. So I do want the screen on this one. And you might have to stop down the ISO or the um, F stop a little bit so that it can. There we go. Thank you. Ah. Did my battery die? I think it was just the battery. I don't know. The battery's full. It didn't like something I did. Okay, so the exposure triangle. And this is not memorize this today. We're going to be talking about this the entire time you're in this program. Um, Cinematography, all of yesterday was exposure triangle all over again. Because when I got out to their shoot on Sunday, they were, um, their settings were really, really all over the place. Uh, in fact, it, it, it was just not even close. But when you started throwing in the elements of the heat and they were hiking out through Sand Hills Park, um, they, they just got discombobulated about it. So this needs to become pretty much muscle memory for you when you're considering the exposure triangle. So, shutter speed. <clears throat> now, I try to simplify this as much as possible because it is not, um, again, none of this stuff is rocket science, but we're throwing a lot of things at you at once. So, we're going we're gonna to inch into this as we get rolling. So, you have your ISO. I think it's doing that because I don't have a card in there. Like it's. Yeah. It could be your settings. I bet it's on. Let's look at. Let's just find out. Not in interview. But it's definitely shutting off like super fast. So, yeah, auto power offset 30 seconds. Um, get comfortable with this menu. Start playing with it. Now, there's a lot of things that you do not need to worry about in here. But the Canon menu system, if you're utilizing the Canon, um, is super simple to get to know. 
Um, and what I love about the T6i, it's a mid-range model. When you move into a pro model like a 5D, uh, anything in that next capacity, it, the menu just kind of adds a few more items, but it's still formatted the same, which I love. It makes it really nice to get around in there. And it's touchscreen, so um, you don't have to dial through it if you don't want to. You can touch it. <clears throat> so I, I do like the menu system. I think it's, it's easy to utilize. So what I had to do there, my camera was shutting off every 30 seconds. That is going to be a pain in your butt. Don't, don't let that. So you got to get it set up to you. Um, and I'm not going to go through the entire menu right now. I think that's where if Zoe and I can produce a video and then you can look for the item you need, that would probably be a better use of, of 90 minutes than me just going through each item. Um, so I do want to dial back over to the exposure triangle. So I got to be in video mode. I should have mentioned that. You can turn on and be in photography, or you go all the way up and you're in video, right? <clears throat> now on the bottom here, I have the three items that are going to dictate your exposure triangle. Um, and we're going to start with just explaining what these three are. And then our first assignment, we're going to dial into just worrying about exposure, getting things exposed correctly. So uh, that very first one is our shutter speed. This can be altered with my index finger on that top wheel. Okay. That's really convenient if you're doing photography <laughs> because that shutter speed can be manipulated all the time in photography. However, in video, you really want that double what your frame rate is. So what is our frame rate? Let's find out. I'm going to go in. I want your frame rate typically to be 24. I don't mind if you shoot in 30, um, but 24 is what I prefer. That, is, that gives you the right motion blur that looks really cinematic. All the Hollywood films that you watch, um, the big blockbusters are exported in 24 frames per second. So if I click my little Q and I'm trying to make sure you can see. So right down here, I see FHD 2997. You can kind of see that. Oop. I'm going to click on that. That is full HD, full high definition. So that means I'm shooting 1920 by 1080. Let's go with this first. So I want to be at 24. I think I'm going to switch to 24. But full HD, I do not want to be in 720. I want to be in 1080. So I'm going to pick that and get back in here. Um, so we have FHD 2997, FHD 2997, which is a lower quality. Um, and then just HD means it's 720. So you want FHD on your T6Is. And I'll have to, I'm not sure, Cali, on yours without seeing it, but it'll be really similar. Um, and yours goes up to 60. You won't, you can, but you don't need to. I, I, would, I prefer 24. Um, <clears throat> So I'm going to select 24 for myself on full HD. And now, uh, because it's a photography camera, shutter speed doesn't dial in exact. But you want your shutter speed to be double. I'm just going to say two times. Save some. Two times your frame rate. So if my frame rate is 24, full HD, um, I'm at 60 right now, which would be pretty close, but I can get to 50. Unfortunately, the next option is 40. 48 would be ideal. This professional model, that professional model, will dial in to exactly double your shutter speed. Um, you can have a little leeway there, but I want to be around 50. It's real tempting because this being a photography camera and your finger can easily adjust that, let me put it this way. The, the boys, when I got there on, on Sunday, were at 3,000. They were 10 times where I wanted them to be, 100 times where I wanted them to be um, for, for their shutter speed. And it will make it really, really jittery and it'll get all wonky. But their image was super grainy because it was so dark, the next thing they did to counter the darkness was they adjusted the ISO. We'll get to that they had that at like 3,200. Um, your ISO on these cameras is really not good at 3,200. I like the ISO to be around, man, this pen is not great. 
I like the ISO to be around 800 or less on these cameras. Um, <clears throat> this camera has a native ISO of 850, meaning it wants the camera to be at 850, and then you need to adjust other stuff accordingly. Um, this one has two native ISOs, a high, higher one for low light and a low one for outdoor scenarios. With these DSLRs, 800 is a good place to kind of live. You could go to 1,000, 1,200, and it's going to still probably be usable um, before it gets too grainy, but lower is, is typically better for this type of a model. Um, so 800 and lower is, is a good place to live. So right now we have shutter speed two times the frame rate, ISO 800 or less. F-stop, this is where you will make way more adjustments for your exposure is in your f-stop. So that's the middle one here, the 5.6. And this is where, um, with your f-stop, with this particular type of camera, I'm sitting at a 40 millimeter. This is an 18 to 55 lens. Um, when it's at its widest at 18, the aperture or the f-stop is at a 3.5. That's the most opened up it can get. This is letting in light to the lens. And when you look on a cinema lens, you can literally see the aperture opening and closing inside. And I can show you guys, because it's just so big, um, how much more uh, obvious it is than some of these tiny ones. So when you're at an 18, it'll open up to a 3.5. Now, when I'm at a 55, it goes to a 5.6. <clears throat> so your range is somewhere between, and this is minimum, okay? It'll go all the way up to, I believe, a 22. I could be wrong. Let me see. But I have to dial that in. Oh, 32. So I can go up to a 36 f-stop. And we're going to talk more about what all that is later. We can't hit it all today. Um, but you will have a minimum f-stop of 3.5 to 5.6 with a maximum of up to 36. So this is super important <clears throat> because our f-stop can technically go from a 3.5 to a 36. It's a huge range. That's a lot of, uh, of different settings that you can utilize. So because of that, whether you're outdoors, whether you're inside, your main function for adjusting exposure should start with your f-stop, the middle option. Right now it says 6.3. I want to adjust this. And if you're going, oh, my minimum's a 5.6, that's because I'm at a 55. So if I open up to an 18, now I can go, oop, now I can go all the way down to a 3.5 and let in more light. So dabble with some of these things while you have some time here between today and, and Thursday. I'm throwing a lot at you, and I understand that. So there's not a lot of pressure right now. I more want you to get comfortable playing in the system and looking at some of those things. Uh, we'll get this video up onto Learning Zone so you can reference it through an unlisted YouTube link if that helps. Uh, and you do not have to utilize my source necessarily from today. There is hundreds of T6i training, tutorial, review videos. Um, on the internet that are great. I actually um, had a few that I suggested, but ultimately really just make our own because everyone kind of has a different need when they produce that stuff. So <clears throat> you want to get your uh, frame rate set to 24 or 30, okay? and then your shutter speed will be double that. So if I was at, and right now it's at 30, um, since I'm at 24, I'll be at 50, as close to double that as possible. ISO, keep it around 800 or less. For some horrible reason, there is an auto option on ISO. And if you're indoors, it's gonna crank that thing to like 6400 and you won't be able to use it on anything. So I wish I could program these cameras to turn that off. Um, the, the bulk of exposure, with indoors, outdoors, whatever your, where your scenario is, um, you will mess with the f-stop to get that image to the right exposure. And then I, I recommend dabbling, you know, just playing with the auto and the manual settings on the lens. Touching the screen for auto, um, 
using the focus ring at the end for manual. That's another thing that I think is worth uh, kind of tinkering with as we, as we go forward. We're going to get into more cleaning stuff. I don't want you cleaning too much, but you do need to know some just basic. Now, if you're looking through and you're seeing a pretty heavy spec, I got one, thanks. If you're seeing a pretty heavy spec on your image, um, and likely you guys aren't going to know, we'll um, dig into the computer and actually looking at our files here soon. But this is a, don't touch the sensor. Um, I. I don't mean to like talk to you guys like children, but it is important. I need to just state some of these things because clearly I've had the, it, you know, there's a reason we have to mention it. But if you just spray this on here, it'll be safe. You just get air on there. Um, if you can tell it's dirty, if you can see stuff in there, uh, sand, I, I, where I shoot a lot of nature is in the sand hills up north of town. Sand is like our worst enemy next to moisture. We're very fortunate. If we were in Florida, we'd all have uh, little moisture packets everywhere. Um, in Colombia, we couldn't shoot for the first 30 minutes of any day after leaving the hotel. We'd go outside and our cameras would be completely uh, covered in moisture. So if you're seeing a speck, first approach is this. It's likely just a little bit of dust and this will blow it off and that solves a ton of our problems. Such a nice cheap tool. It works so well. <clears throat> It's so tempting when you can see it to just get it off. If you have a spec on here, I do have some cleaning supplies that will allow me to get that off, but I'd rather train you on that first, where you actually like wipe your sensor clean. And it's a very, very stressful uh, practice because if your sensor is damaged, this is by far the most expensive component of a camera is that sensor. Um, so if it's scratched and damaged, then that'll, that'll just be uh, pretty much it for that. Now, the other thing is our lens is what you're going to get your fingerprints on and so on. Does everybody have a lens cloth? Did we get everyone one? If you don't have one, we'll find you one. Um, it's easy to just, just make sure it's clean. Uh, it's tempting to put them in your pocket, things like that. I just wouldn't, um, even if you're going, man, my pants are just right out of the dryer. Uh, just like a nice circular motion around with one finger. Uh, you don't need to apply a lot of pressure. In fact, it's better to um, just have some, some, you know, very moderate pressure, just moving around with it. Fingerprints are the worst thing. My daughter, every time she shoots, like, she just, like, cuffs it. Uh, that does tend to happen. Um, Andrew, did we give you the rubber mount for? It doesn't fit. Okay, we'll get you a better thing for that because that rubber tends to sit on here if you put it on too far and then you're stuck cleaning your lens every time you take it. So they're cool because they're supposed to fit a variety, but I didn't like that component of it. Uh, here, I got another one. If so. Did you get one? Nope. Those are the two supplies we'll start you with. You know, find a spot in your bag for your cleaning stuff so it can stay clean. Um, and the other thing that's really important, you guys don't have a different lens right now, but one thing that people do uh, need to take a lot of precaution on is if you're outdoors, football guys, you come to mind, especially if you are switching lenses out. Um, ag, yeah, that definitely. If you're out in the field, you're switching lenses, that's one of the best ways to get your sensor damaged from our windy, dirty state that we have. You know, we're, we have wind so rough sometimes that maybe you go get in your car, switch that lens out, and then come back. That sensor is, again, um, just reiterating that it's, it's so hard to, uh, if it's scratched, it's pretty much it. Um, that's why cleaning it takes a lot of precaution too. 